Well, again, everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Andres. I think I know most of you who are here today. And um, a little bit of background about me. I am um, originally from Argentina, um, came here to the US to work on my masters at OU. And I'm uh, really by profession a chemical engineer, but I always was uh, very interested in computer programming. And so I pretty much dedicated all my professional career for nearly 20 years to developing software. I used to work for a long time with a lot of the folks who are here at PCI and had a great career there. And I just recently moved uh, earlier this year to Tailwind. And so um, I lead the engineering team there at Tailwind. I did the same thing previously at, at PCI, leading the um, software development team. So today I'm going to talk uh, about um, GUI automation testing. Um, from mostly a developer's perspective and mostly from a Java developer's perspective. Um, hope you find it uh, interesting. It will be probably a shorter talk than usually, so we should have plenty of times for like Q&A at the end. Um, so I did prepare a few slides, although I have to warn you, I was not too inspiring, I think, in general. Like when you come to a developer-minded talk, getting a lot of slides, it's a little boring, but I figured that at least some context uh, is uh, useful here. So, um, you know, as developers, um, I don't know how your progression was, but for me originally, and this was a while ago, um, we were just, focused, I was just focused on writing code, writing good code. I thought, you know, if I write good code, I'm a good professional, I'll test, test my stuff and like, it works. And for the most part, that is right. But as you continue to do that with time and time and time and time and time and more people, then like that model quickly um, breaks and you start realizing, okay, if I can code the functionality, I can probably code with some minimal level of effort, some good tests for it. So later on, I moved very heavily into like being a, um, a really good advocate and almost like evangelist for uh, unit tests and we got um, a lot of really good uh, results in being able to extend you know, that kind of mentality to uh, large scale and like produce really good level of unit tests, have really good coverage, and in general, I would say that actually helped a lot. Um, but then again, you realize that even that is not enough, and so this pyramid here, it's a little bit, um, kind of generic talk, but I gave some references on the slides with some links, you can read more about it. Um, in general, I would say, if you take this concept, it's good, you can't quite take it as um, being very dogmatic or like you have to do this, everybody has to do it the same way, but it's good advice, it, it actually helps. And so moving up the pyramid, uh, you go through you know, increasing levels of complexity in how you build these tests. Although I will speak to that, that even that has changed quite a bit in the last, I would say, um, five years or so, maybe a little more. It has become increasingly simpler to do unit tests, uh, and to do, well, every level of test, but particularly UI tests. There's a lot of um, tools and services to help you do that. Um, and also with the UI frameworks, a lot of that comes kind of integrated with the framework itself, so it has become progressively easier. Uh, they still are quite slower than unit tests, so you still have to have that in mind, although again, there's been a lot of progress in that area where you could even um, buy a service or subscribe to a service and they will do all the launching of the tests, integrate with your CI CD, and so even that is a little, um, is something that you have to take with a grain of salt. So I think in general, it's a good um, model of reference to have where you want to progressively extend the coverage and the amount of tests that you do at different layers because they are really targeting different um, things and different uh, pain points or points where like bugs can be manifested or introduced and so all of them are good, but take it with a grain of salt that you have to really think about what's right for you in your environment, for your software, for your team. So just gotta keep that in mind. So I listed um, 
I mean, I, I gave on these links and there's a lot of kind of different blogs and posts of all kinds, some pretty decent, some not so reliable, but there's a lot of information about why to do unit tests, wh why to do service tests or integration tests, um, why to do UI tests. Um, I figure that I will give you some, um, sorry, take this off. I figure that I will give you some um, real life experiences that I've had. Some of them are fairly recent, so um, hopefully this will be a little bit more relatable to you. So um, one of the things that just happened um, at Tailwind, where I work, is we um, rely on some uh, third-party uh, sites to provide authentication thing. Um, Google, for example, where like you go through their Gmail OAuth flow, and so you authenticate within your app with some social media provider. So we do that with two networks, Pinterest and Instagram. And you figure like that stuff is super tested, like never fails. Well, it actually it did fail and it was pretty bad for us because we lost, um, like think about the, the concept of submitting a bug for somebody, like for, for one of those networks, it's like a major bureaucracy and, and so they eventually fixed it but it was like um, full two days. It also happened over the weekend so like people are not normally working but the moral of the story is like for two days uh, people couldn't sign up to our tool. So like we lost two days of, we're a subscription-based software, so we lost two days of revenue and money and castle and people complaining. And so um, that's a good use case because really like we have a lot of API tests and we you know do API integration with those platforms, but at the end of the day, like there's no other way to test that um, authentication piece of the workflow unless you do it through the UI test. They actually on purpose don't let you enter a password or submit, you know, do authentication other than from their provided screens for security, obviously. So that's a real life case. So if you have some platform that you are building or you already have where um, you're authenticating through a third party or providing some other UI function that comes from another party, um, Hopefully this is relatable to you and good advice that you might want to consider testing that. The way we run that test now, so we, since then we produce one of these tests, and what we do is we run it as part of our um, CI CD pipeline, and so once a day we have an automated test that goes, and it's the one that I will show actually, and goes and tries to authenticate and proves that it's right. Um, the other thing that was interesting on that case is that um, it broke actually two times. One time was broken for everybody, all browsers, and then in another case, and I can't quite recall if it was before the big break or after the big break, it only broke for certain browsers. So that's another aspect that um, you have to be mindful of. Uh, most of our users at Tailwind use Chrome, of course, uh, but there's some that use um, other types of browsers and you know, could be different. Um, the UI could behave differently from um, one browser to the other. So another example that um, this was mostly when I was at PCI that we um, resorted to doing a UI test is we had a pretty rich, actually pretty good um, uh, component library or widget library. Today with React, there's a lot of uh, appeal of basically getting components from somebody who has coded those components. Hey, great, this guy has a chart component. I will go grab it, use it. And those things, again, like, they have unit tests and you hope that whoever is doing the component has good coverage and they never break it. And for the most part that it holds true. Um, you know, you can look at GitHub, you can look at how many stars they have, you can look at their tests even. Uh, but from time to time they do break. And uh, for us, we rely on that very heavily on all the screens. And most of the time they wouldn't break on a component by component basis where like you would say, yeah, they should have caught this in unit tests it would break on like more edge cases or real life cases where like we really needed to um, produce a test of how we use that component in our application. Um, so that was another real life case that we uh, found some pretty good success with uh, testing from the UI. Um, the third one that I have here is like I've done this many times, like we as developers break UI stuff fairly often I would say and I cited there, at least for me, um, CSS is one of those things where like, you, I kind of, it's code, but it's really not code. It's like, 
not harmful. I just, you know, just made this button have a different background color, and you know, you from time to time like um, change it to the wrong class, provide the, the wrong combinations that are at the wrong level, and so things begin to be misaligned, and it's one of those things that it's like really costly and painful to have humans test. It's very easily testable. So one of the techniques that we used there was actually a fairly simple test, which is like you go hit the screen. Like we knew certain screens are a good representation of like that kind of um, a functionality, CSS, JS. Um, so we would hit those screens, take a screenshot, uh, compare with a baseline screenshot, and do a pixel by pixel comparison difference. And if you know, we, for the most part, didn't expect to see any major differences, we have a little bit of a threshold because that is not a perfect comparison. But it did help identify some of these issues that, again, we don't often relate as developers as being code issues. And for the most part, I will categorically, categorically deny that I broke it, or like my friend broke it, or anybody on my team broke it. But inevitably, yes, we broke it. Um, but that's another good uh, use case. And lastly, um, this used to happen a lot also. We had some older um, JavaScript-based libraries, grids, some very complex um, JavaScript-driven uh, widgets. And uh, in particular, some of those widgets used to do tricks slash hacks with JavaScript of things a different browser did differently, like the copy paste or selection or you know weird stuff that they were, you know, working around how to do it in the early days before they became quote unquote the standard operations. And those uh, used to break too. I remember one time like the copy paste was like totally broken. Like one day we came to the office, Chrome auto upgraded down. Oh, there goes my day, my week. And, and so like the worst part of that is like it's still broken even if you test it, but it's good to have some comfort like for the most part, when that happened, nobody really knew like how long was this broken? Is every customer broken? Is every version broken? So, if you have some level of automation around that, that you know your application is somewhat prone to issues that happen when the browser up updates, um, you could test that. There's like a million other cases, but these were some that are um, real things that I have experienced, and I thought that could be relatable to most most of the people doing a web app. All right, so um, here I'm going to talk a little bit about the tool landscape. Um, it's pretty messy for what I would like to see. It's not as clean and as um, easy to identify, like, should I rely on this tool? Which one should I adopt? What's this tool good at versus the other one good at? And so. I gave um, all of the stuff here on the left. I have put links. If you download the presentation later on from the Meetup, you can go read those things. There's like 30 best tools. Well, I need probably one, perhaps two. Like, what criteria have you used? It, it's really hard. Um, and in a way, it's understandable because, like I was saying at the beginning, different applications have different needs. But I just wanted to highlight that if you are thinking about doing UI tests that there's not a de facto standard, Selenium kind of is if you go that way, but you have a lot of other tools, a lot of other tools not based on Java, based on JavaScript, for example. Puppeteer is the one that we use at Tailwind. Um, there's, there's like a million tools, but all of them are imperfect and they do some things really well and some things not so well, so. Um, mm, the advice that I wanted to give here is like, you probably, if you're going to adopt this, you have to spend some time looking at what's important for you and what you want to do with it and kind of evaluate which tool is right for you. Today, because we're here in the Java users group, I'm going to talk about one tool that we use that is actually really good for Java, it makes things really simple, but I have no affiliation with them at all and like, I don't recommended, I'm just saying like this is a good tool to look at, um, has worked very well for us and it's very easy to adopt. Um, 
rather than that, you have to basically do a little bit of homework, um, and it's not easy. So I put here, like this is, uh, the picture on the right is a um, thing that I took from one of the um, sites. It's actually kind of confusing too because they have SOAP UI, which, yeah, it has UI on the name, but it's not really meant for uh, GUI testing. It's more for um, web and API testing. Um, you gotta be careful because there's a lot of them that they want you to pay a ton of money and big cost to implement and um, very heavy to operate too. So anyway, you have to, the conclusion is that you have to do some uh, research as to what's good for you. All right, so to do that, I, I put here like a sample criteria. You know, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but basically same thing, like this is a criteria that we have used, it kind of worked okay, it makes sense. Um, you can use this for choosing any other type of tool, but um, in general, like you need to develop what is important, and so this is an example. For us, cost was important. We really didn't want to pay big ticket um, items for like doing testing. Um, so free, there's some tools that are free. Um, um, easy to learn and adopt, like something that people who um, are on the team already actually know how to code in or can learn it very quickly. That was very important. Um, having a simple API, so um, some of these APIs can be very obscure, very complicated, very complex, and so like in general, you want your developers to be good at the API they are, they are developing, be really good at the APIs they rely on, like the SDKs for the language, or like um, if you're integrating with um, other uh, par third-party libraries or components, be very good at that, but really not, it's not like a really good thing to say, okay, well, this person now is really expert on the testing API, can only use it for testing, so um, that's important. And the other thing that was uh, important for us was to be able to record some of the tests because, again, we had actual, um, on our team, we had um, people who were not coders um, on the development team, um, mostly analysts, um, that sometimes will have to you know, we run into this issue and so they have to show it to somebody and so be able to like record the execution and even record a test or create a test from recording was important and then lastly integration, be able to like send the results somewhere. So um, this is my last slide, I think. Um, and so the tool that I'm gonna be showing today, again, no affiliation, it's, it's a nice tool. It probably has some things that does extremely well and some that may not work for you, uh, but just wanted to introduce it. It's called Catalan Studio. I put there a screenshot with the um, uh, website. Uh, it's totally free, we uh, really like that. Uh, for us it was very easy to learn because uh, we were mostly at PCI, <coughs> a um, Java-based uh, development team, and so this we could code in Java, we could do Groovy, which is a little simpler, but it understands Java, we can co code pure Java and do external libraries, all sorts of things. Um, it has a really simple API, we really like this, where like they did some abstraction on top of the uh, Selenium API, which is more hardcore, um, and so it, it made common things way simpler in terms of sy syntax, uh, but if you really needed to go deeper and use the, um, the lower level API, you had it available, you have it available for you. Uh, supports recording, supports integration, um, the other, things that we really looked at that we liked was that they update very frequently, so they have a monthly release cadence, which is really nice. Uh, they have really good documentation, and actually, I was surprised because it's free, totally free. And they have no paid uh, subscription. Uh, you can get like paid support or something, but they do reply to issues, it's amazing. Um, so, so what I'll do for the rest of the talk is to um, walk you through a test and then we'll finish up with Q&A. Okay, so I'm gonna go a little um, slow and I'm gonna zoom in for that. Let's see if I can get this back there, okay. Hope I don't mess it up again, okay. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. So let me go, let's start from the left. Okay, so who here is um, using uh, Eclipse for your uh, ID? Most people, 
some people? Okay. All right, so if you come from uh, Eclipse, um, IntelliJ is not that different, but basically this is Eclipse with a little bit of a facelift and modifications. It's really the Eclipse API. Um, so what they've done, they like customize it so that they remove most of the stuff that is not related to test. But I'll walk you through some of the things that um, are really nice here so um, you can get the concept. It's still fairly high level for today, but um, if you're interested, I can talk a little bit more offline after the talk. Um, one of the things that is really nice is like when you um, are running these tests, sometimes you want to execute the same test again in different environments. Um, sometimes it's production, dev, QA. Um, like when you run it on CI, CD, you want to run certain things on um, the actual master checkout code that you just built but sometimes you want to run things against production, so this makes it really easy to um, have an environment where you can define variables. You can define any number of environment variables here through the UI, you don't have to do crazy stuff on shell or command prompt, uh, and you can see them, you can inspect them, and then uh, you can um, tell the test suites or the tests I want you to run on the default environment or QA or dev or whatever environment you run. Um, that it's really powerful. Um, and I'll talk about test cases that that's really where you run your tests, but they have a nice kind of folder system where you can um, um, identify the different kind of tests and organize them. Um, similarly, they have suites, so you can have a collection of tests, form a suite, and run an entire suite um, with one command. And that's really useful for like the CI CD pipeline. You can also have different kinds of suites for different um, parts of the system that execute, that those tests have a different execution frequency. For example, some tests can execute daily, some hourly, some like once a release. Um, the other thing that I uh, really like, I'm not showing it here, but they, um, a lot of the times, and especially we as developer, we have this tendency like everything is just code. And so sometimes, especially when we do unit tests, we have a tendency to create some data for a test and we just embed it there with the code and like test code and test data that are intermingled and it kind of works okay when it's a few tests and when it's you, but when you know you have other people in the team who are doing the, this test, having that separation between what's data and what's the actual code to run the test is very helpful. So they have that kind of built in here where you can externalize everything that is data you know, taking CSV, JSON, XML, things like that, and uh, persist it as a file, and then you, from your test, you can access that pretty easily to see data or to do something for a particular test. Um, really don't know what checkpoints is, I haven't used it. Um, this is really nice too, so they, um, they introduced this not too many versions ago, where um, you can have hooks on your tests, where, or listeners, where like, if um, certain tests um, execute some fails, you can take some action, and so you can um, decouple that. With this, you can decouple those things that are really not part of the test logic, and in a lot of the cases, they're like the same thing that you wanna do uh, for any test, and so you can decouple those from your tests themselves, so your tests just only do what you're testing, and these things will go like, if it fails, send an email, or you know, notify somebody, so you can have some level of uh, decoupling. Um, you can do fancier things like when some test begins executing, you know, post something to Slack, for example, or um, to any chat client and let people know when each test finish, you know, logging how long it's taking, the status, so you can do all sorts of fancy things with uh, test listeners. Um, they also uh, have um, reports, and so um, one of the most, um, powerful uh, things that this has is like you can, um, for each test, and it's a little bit harder when you zoom in, let me see. Okay, here it is. So for each test, you can see like, they have a nicer log that consolidates and you can see step by step what it's doing. Um, you also have like the full console log, you have log of events. Um, so you can get pretty granular in terms of log, like normally, who cares, why do I care to see, but this test, I didn't mention this earlier, but on that pyramid, these tests 
will sometimes um, be a little flaky and fail because some of the mechanisms to especially wait for the DOM to be ready or wait for an element to appear or disappear or change, it's, you know, it's not as easy to um, sometimes see, but, um, but anyway, they, sometimes you have to look at the logs and make sure that you understand why a particular test um, has failed. So that's pretty useful functionality. Um, and then they have um, other things that you can do where um, this was very useful for us too, where you can um, introduce your own um, kind of utility functions outside of the test. So they try to make it very simple. I'll show you in a second where like once you're in a test, like you don't have to define many methods. Like it's mostly like a method is a test and a test is a method and just like keep it simple. Um, but if you want to do utility functions and things like that, they have uh, the ability for you to introduce that through these scripts and you can do Groovy or you can do Java. And we, we did use um, quite a bit of Java to make some of the um, integration um, or some of the test syntax a little easier. So there's a lot of functionality there. Um, the other thing that um, I wanted to mention is um, you have the ability to test web and mobile with the same tool. That's kind of rare. Most of the tool either focus on one mobile, especially the, the mobile tools they mostly focus on like allowing you to test mobile uh, devices. Um, but here you can test either one of them. Um, and let's see, there is one more thing that I wanted to um, show, um, which is um, this object spy. So, um, see if I can do a little test here. So what this allows you to do is like you can tell it a URL and once you go to the URL, it kind of pops up this little uh, rectangle that is like um, if you're used to Chrome uh, developer tools and inspecting, it's like that. But then you can capture, um, if you do that, and it's what uh, alt, let's see if I find it. This, okay, so you can capture there and then it will give you all of the information about that element and you can basically save this in your test or you can use the information here and it's pretty useful for um, basically getting a selector if you are unsure of how to actually get that uh, element and do something with it, so for example, uh, well, let's do one that would be more uh, interesting that I'm doing in my test. So um, if I go here and I wanna wanted to say, okay, I wanna go and click, let me move this here. I wanna actually come here and click on the login button. Okay, well, how can I get that um, login button? How can I identify it on my code for the test so that you know then I can click on it? And so here again, you can see that it capture um, quite a bit of information about the XPath um, attributes like the tag, the um, text, uh, what class. So you can use different types of um, selectors and it makes it really easy to um, not have to spend a lot of trial and error time uh, coding and you know trying to identify the right elements. Some elements like this ones are really easy um, some are definitely more complicated to identify. Um, so that was one. So that's the spy functionality. The other one is the record web. I'll see if I can show you this one. So if you go, let's just go to Google. Um, so what I can do is I can tell it, okay, um, go there, go to Google, and then anything that I do there, it's kind of like if you've ever used Excel macros where you can tell it, whatever I'm doing in Excel, just keep recording it and create a test for me. So, so if I do that and search Teclahoma, you can see that it recorded that I went to this input, I typed Teclahoma, then I press enter that I clicked on an element, for some reason it detected I double click, and so if I stop it now, I basically have 
a test that I can save and it's kind of pre-made and it's pretty easy and powerful for getting people started and maybe lose a little bit of the fear of like coding, especially again in our team we had people who were not, uh, team members who were not uh, coders, they were mostly analysts or they're testing and so it lowers the barrier of entry by quite a bit. Um, honestly, once you learn how to code, then nobody uses this. So it's not a big deal, but it does help um, with that aspect of it. So that's kind of a little bit of overview of the tool. I'm gonna go and begin to show a test. How is this, is this size okay? Can you guys read it in the back? Okay. All right, so um, I will walk, so what I'll do is I'll walk through a test that was a utility function library, I'll show that also. Um, so let's walk through kind of how um, a test uh, is composed. So it pretty much looks like Java. You can actually do tests that are pure Java and you can use pure Java syntax. Um, but here what they've done, it, and it's mostly a UI trick where they have um, hooked into Eclipse uh, interpreter um, that interprets the Java code and they like eliminated some uh, basically boilerplate like the method definition but you can see things familiar like this where it knows that this is a method that implements the script run interface. It just doesn't have the method wrapper but if you were to look un under the hood then you'll see that that's the run method on that script that is showing there. So there's a little bit of boilerplate removal. So for Java guys like us, so like you have import statements at the top, um, nothing crazy there, and then um, just go through the API. So I'll, we'll walk through the code, mostly with the idea of giving you um, basically a glimpse, a sense for what's available on the API. Um, this is again mostly Selenium API, and what they've done in Catalan is that they've made a few operations a little bit, um, they have provided syntactic uh, sugar, basically. So open a browser, that's kind of very easy. When you open a browser, you can tell it um, whether you wanna open a new window, reuse a window, open a new tab, so there's a, a few alternatives there, but basically web UI, open a browser, you tell it where to go. Um, you can get the title of the window. In my case, I'm using that later on, you'll see how. Um, Clicking um, on an element also is very simple. So you have a static method, webui.click. And this is where Catalon makes things um, a little easier. So um, in general, for you to click on an element first, you have to locate it to do any operation really. But so to interact with a element on the screen, like, a, like I showed a button or a text box or a select or whatever HTML element, you have to locate it now. Um, to locate it, you could do that through different mechanisms. And like I was showing that little tool that captures a bunch of attributes. In this test, I'm mostly locating either by type, um, whether it's um, basically a div or a span or an A, an anchor, or whatever, whatever HTML tag type. Um, and here in this particular case, I'm locating a anchor a element test objects dot a where the class is this class um, again depending on how you struct your um, web app is a structure in this case we don't have a lot of control because I'm testing as you will see the Pinterest uh, sign in um, ideally if you are in control of this is where you will really as a developer um, kind of go full circle and make sure that every one of your elements has an ID, kind of like what we do in the database. Like there's some good standard practices where like, okay, I wanna be able to identify things in the easiest possible way. What's the easiest possible way? Oh, okay, I give it an ID, then I know how to call it. And you know, have a system for pr giving really good IDs. And just like with primary keys in the database, then what happens? Somebody designs a table and no primary key, okay. You gotta select something some other way, right? Um, so you have that that same paradigm here. So clicking on, on an element. Um, this is fairly common with tests and I'll, um, I'll show you um, two ways of waiting for things. So there's um, 
the really proper way of um, way or safe way of waiting for something is that there's APIs and there's low level uh, things that happen. Again, just like with Java, let's say with concurrency uh, task, you have futures and so you can, if you're gonna execute something that, you know, it's gonna be asynchronous and it's gonna take some time to execute any task, you could use um, uh, completable future or any other one of the future implementations and just say, hey, like, when it's done, wake up, and so you can have a blocking operation that gets called when that future completes. Um, you have the same kind of thing here with this type of methods where you could say, um, wait for this particular element to be visible, to be in the DOM, to not be in the DOM. You have the positive and false um, identifications, and this is really nice because like, you don't have to be prescriptive as to how long to wait. Like, we know that that can change um, sometimes drastically from one time you execute the test from one browser to the other, so it's really unreliable to wait for a fixed amount of time. And so this is kind of the safer way. Sometimes uh, you have uh, no control over when that is going to happen. So in a particular case, we're clicking on the login and then there's a pop-up that shows up and it was not easy to, it's not easy to generally detect when a pop-up um, is ready so you can resort to the old thread.sleep. Kind of embarrassing to be showing this on a talk, but there you go. Um, I used to get very mad when people introduced this in our code, so it still makes me a little mad, but it wasn't too evil right here. So again, clicking on that element, wait for it. And this is also really important and it's not so simple sometimes, especially when you have to switch. So depending on how your app is architected or what your what screens you're hitting. Sometimes you have to deal with um, either pop-ups, which is a little other window, and you have to switch back and forth between, you see in this test case, between like my main window and the pop-up window, and like make sure that I can get elements on both. Uh, and sometimes you have to also deal with iframes, which is kind of the same kind of nightmare where you have to like get you were on a screen and you have an iframe on it, you had to be on the, you, you start on the main context and then you had to go into the iframe context and do things there and then come out of the iframe context and all that switching back and forth used to be a total pain and they've made it pretty easy to now perform those operations on switching there, um, identifying a button, uh, identifying um, if this was another um, really interesting thing that happens uh, on um, on tests for web apps is that sometimes, and there's like different schools of thought um, with pros and cons, both of them. Uh, some people advocate that for every test you have to begin with, if you're testing a web app that uses authentication, like you have to start from a clean slate, 100% every test. And so you would basically, on every test, destroy the browser, when it finishes, like close the browser, make sure like there's no um, profile information stored so that when you come back in and you start a new test, the first thing you do is you go log in, brand new session, navigate to where you wanna test and begin that test. So I generally think that's for the, m I, I can see the value, but for the most part, it seems like a total overkill, uh, although, yeah, there's, there's pros and cons of either approach. So uh, in this particular case, um, the way I coded it is like it can work either way. So basically it will detect um, whether we're using that. And uh, some, you can control that, like I was saying before, with the profile and with some settings that are, I mean, you don't have to code on every test whether you wanna log in or not log in. So you, ca you can control that at a higher level. But in general, basically, I coded this, this test where it would work under either one of those scenarios. So if you were logged in, I can detect here by looking at a given element that, hey, you were logged in. And if you were not logged in, then I will type the email and the password on that little pop-up, okay? And this is something really nice, too, that I, I showed on the profile. As you can see here, um, my username and my passwords are not hard-coded here on the, um, on the test itself and can be passed as environment variables and that way you can again perform tests. Sometimes that's another feature of um, you, why test UI, I didn't mention it on the, um, 
on the use cases, but this was really important for us. So when you have an application where you have user groups that have different authorizations or permissions, sometimes the screen works great when you're admin, and we as developer, we like, who wants to test uh, like with 10 million permissions? We're always admin, always you know, sudo. And so you're testing yourself, and you're running a lot of unit tests, especially your integration, and you're running with this special accounts that have permission for everything and everything works and then you go run the exact same test with like some user that has a lower level of permission and the screen should still work but it doesn't or like you have those bugs where like hey this person is only supposed to be able to read but hey I can change things now so for us we were doing an enterprise application though where those were like really bad bugs to have because people got really um, concern about like you know those kind of security holes with people who didn't actually have authorization being able to change data so that's another good use case of things that it's really like you can test some of that at the um, lower levels of the pyramid but sometimes you have to resort to testing on the uh, on the UI so here is parameterized I can run this test with any type of uh, user and click on authorize here's what I was saying before where like I had to now switch, that's why I had to get here, like, I was in the main window, I get the title, there's a little pop-up, I gotta switch to that, and then I gotta switch back to the original one. Um, and finally, I can go there. Um, on every test, I'm performing, you know, you perform some sort of verification, and the way um, I'm verifying that is by um, waiting for something to appear and type something on it, and then we close the browser. So as you can see, it's, you see now the test in action in, in a second, but it's really procedural programming. It's not like super fancy. It's nothing to be afraid of. And like I was saying, in this case, uh, for us, it was a really useful um, test case to have. Um, so let me run it now and um, get to see some of that. I'm gonna uh, go back to, and hopefully when I run it, you can still see it, um, but, um, before I run, let's go through a couple of things. So um, on this particular tool, you can just, you have the ability to run any test on like either one of the major browsers, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, um, no um, IE because I'm on Mac, but if I were on Windows, you can also have, um, well, I guess Edge now, but Edge is Chrome soon, so it won't matter. Um, but you can also run on headless mode, which is basically the mode where it's silent and you don't s actually see the, um, the browser, and that's usually a little faster and also uh, a little bit more reliable. It runs a lot better. Uh, you can run it on um, servers that don't have a UI, so you know, more easily to integrate on the uh, CI CD pipeline. And then you can do, um, they have a mode which is remote, where if you have a service that has the instances where you want to run this thing, then you can run remotely and run on um, mobile devices. So I'm just gonna run it on Chrome for now. And this is also really nice, which a lot of the tools don't have, um, is the ability to debug. So I can do line by line debugging. You can put breakpoints here, just like you do in Java, um, through Eclipse, and put some breakpoints there. I'm not gonna stop here, but, um, so that's uh, also a really nice capability there, so I'm gonna go execute it. Um, on the drawback sites, I find like this tool, compared to the JavaScript tools, like I said, we use Puppeteer, um, a Tailwind, um, it does take a little longer to bootstrap, but anyway, so you see here, I, it went there, I click on the sign up, um, and it failed, like I was saying before. They're a little flaky sometimes, so let me run it again, you'll see how it works a new session, maybe that's why it failed. So again, it will go in, it will click it so fast you can't quite perceive it with your eyes, but it will go in, click on the login with Pinterest, um, and then try to fill up the uh, OAuth form for it with a username and an account. So there you go, I typed the username and the password and then it hit okay on that form and now it's waiting for this one, and when it waits for this one, it says test pass, and verifies that the test pass. So I'm gonna run it again to see if you can see it one more time. 
it's a pretty simple test um, again so it takes about 16 seconds but that's with waiting for the authorization to come back and everything so again it goes in clicks on sign up for Pinterest pops up the form types the email and the password hits OK and I was waiting for this guy to basically say yeah you have an account and it will type um, something there that says test pass and that's it so pretty simple test but like I was saying at the beginning it, at least we have a way now of verifying that that form uh, works and we can rest a little better a little bit better at night so um, I think this covers everything that I wanted to show you but we have plenty of time well we have about 10 minutes uh, for questions yes they asked me to make sure you get the mic and you say your question out loud so I don't have to repeat it very formal today. Okay, so there's an Android option. Yes. What is it actually running? Like Chrome within Android or the um, default browser? Or? Um, I don't really know. That's a good question. Uh, I don't really know. I think uh, actually you can do browser and native um, testing, so native screen testing, uh, but I haven't used it for that, so. Maybe you can go in and check, keep me honest. Um, but it's, it's I, I have found it like that's kind of a unique feature of this particular tool. Most of the um, mobile testing tools, I just do mobile, so. Yes, sir, another question there. So, um, you guys created the test objects class. Is that is that just to make your selectors oh, yeah. easier? Yeah, let me Can show you, you show that. Us that. Yeah, yeah, very nice. So this one is more of a formal, like this is a Java. So what, um, as you can see here, you have like annotations that you could do. You can do basically more of the um, real programming that you would do for your app. Um, they have Java docs. Again, I put it here like inline, but you could do, um, if you're gonna do something bigger, you can like have a, uh, almost like a library that you code under your normal, you know, source control or test automation, especially the unit testing and uh, the, um, the integration layer. So you can have it there and then import it here as a jar basically. Um, but this was pretty simple. So what, what we did is mostly uh, some static methods so that instead of saying three lines of code, we could do it with one. Like you can, you know, you have to say new test object, set the properties of an array as a list and so on. Uh, but yes, yeah, you can see I have, you know, var args, you have the full, the full power of Java. Um, and so this is mostly what it is, is like how to select um, an element by giving it the properties, how to select an input. Uh, this one is a, a good, case where if you see like we, you know, we, I, we wanna select an input uh, field um, f with a given property and set a given property um, to a given value. And so we would have had to do all this boilerplate code and it's just a lot easier for the programming. So it's mostly, uh, again, wrappers around things that would take a few lines of code um, we also um, did a little bit of exemption handling, uh, maybe a little bit better than the normal one that they provide. Uh, so it, it, we kept it pretty simple. On the real, uh, like um, at PCI, where we had um, this um, component library, so what we did is, because we're testing a widget library, um, again, instead of working through the HTML, like if when you look, let's say, at a chart, like that would be a div inside a span, inside another div, inside some other things. And so like it becomes really cumbersome to interact. So let's say that you're on a chart and you wanna click on the axis or you wanna zoom in, like it becomes really, uh, you can do it, but like on every test it becomes really burdensome to be interacting with the HTML lev level um, elements. And so we wrapped all that around, sometimes the widget libraries like 
they would do that for you. They would provide you an SDK, but in that case, ours didn't, so we had to build a little bit of wrapper around that so we could say chart dot click on axis, and it will do all that lookup for you internally. Any other questions? I'll go then. Um, we've seen you running the test in your computer and took 10 seconds. But I imagine when you have a big complex application, you have a hundred of tests to run. What yep. is the performance of running all that test suite uh, in a headless mode? Um, in my case, so in my case, the 15 seconds actually they're not so much related to the test as to what that workflow is because you you see like it actually clicked pretty quickly through things. Um, so locating the elements and clicking through them, it, it was actually probably two seconds, and then the other one is like waiting for the authorization to tell you that you're done, and then after I'm doing a sign up test, which is like in our app when you sign up, we crunch a lot of data. And so it takes about five to 10 seconds to do that. And then you, we are like, okay, oh, hey, you are a new customer. And typically, if you go through any sign up tool of any kind, it takes a few seconds. So I would say that's this is kind of a um, oddball in that sense. Most of the tests take around one to two seconds. Um, but headless is a little faster, I would say, maybe. 10, 20% faster, as a rule of thumb, it's hard to give a, a precise number. It's not like it's an order of magnitude, it's a percentage. And the most important thing with headless is, like I was saying before, that if you're running on continuous integration, you can run on servers that don't need like a UI installed. And, like, it's a lot cleaner. It's less prone to like glitches of the browser. Sometimes the browser, when it starts like any program, you've seen it on your lab, but like, okay, it's taking 10 seconds to start Chrome. What is going on right now? And so headless, you remove some of that. Make sense? So is it gonna work if you're trying to run it in, in, in Safari now instead of Chrome? Yeah, let's, uh, well, you know. Hard to guarantee if you're a developer that <laughs> anything works, but we'll try it. If it doesn't work, it's not my fault. I called it right. It's, gonna be the in it's an internet problem. Okay, so let me zoom out here a little bit and I'll run it again. I think actually I was a good developer and I tested it earlier in, uh, but you know, the demo gods, sometimes I don't make them too happy. So I'm gonna go back to my test. And now tell it that I want to debug on, what do you want to do, Safari? Oh my God. <laughs> Why am I doing this? I'm regretting it. I actually didn't run it on Safari. I ran it in um, Firefox, but we'll see. If it works, it means that we automatically end the session. <laughs> no more tempting of the demo gods. Hey, so far. Test pass. There you go. Yeah. All right. Okay. Any more questions? Yes, sir. What does your CI CD integration look like? And so they've improved that quite a bit. It used to be, um, well, so we use um, um, Team City. And they don't have a native integration with Team City, so, but they have a mode, let me see, like they have this mode that um, you can build for every test, like a, a command line version of it. And so you could build steps on your, um, on Team City, that's what we could do. And like you just execute the command line um, test and typically when you do that you execute like a whole suite at a time not every test so it was a little finicky uh, they do have integration with um, Jenkins I think that is native let me see it's on the menu here they didn't put it here um, and bamboo docker they have others I have not personally used them but 
that's one of the things that I was saying before where they, they seem to be um, really good at listening to the community and incorporating uh, new things better definitely than other tools that are free. Um, so I would imagine if you, I don't know what you use, so would you use Jenkins for Team City? Team City, okay, well, there you go, command line. But um, the other thing is that um, they recently, in that regard, uh, also did like a um, plugin store where you can submit a plugin even if they don't have something native. And so you may be in like, I haven't checked lately, but you, there may be somebody who developed a plugin that integrates with Team City. Okay, well, I think we are like right on time, a couple of minutes over, so thank you everyone. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll post this on the meetup, uh, the presentation, and I'll post the code too. Um, so hopefully you can do some good UI testing on your own.